My name is Greg Riccardi, and I'm a professor at Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida. And um, uh, I, uh, my training is as a computer scientist, but some time ago, I realized that I was more interested in people using information than I was in uh, uh, computer science, and began to work with scientists on trying to help them deal with the information problems that they had. And I was very fortunate um, something like 15 years ago to, uh, to be invited to participate in a biodiversity informatics project. Uh, and we maintained a, an image repository for taxonomists for many years. And uh, eventually I, I uh, became part of a big um, initiative of the National Science Foundation. And um, I've had a lot of interactions with uh, GBIF over the years. So I want to talk a little bit about our project and, and why our project, how our project has been successful. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about climate chaos. Um, and, um, and, then I, and then finally, uh, Ireland and GBIF and how all that works together. So some 10 years ago, uh, a couple of people in the, in the US National Science Foundation decided that biodiversity collections, natural history collections, were woefully underutilized and undersupported, and that uh, the federal government should step in and put a lot of money into trying to make information about natural history collections accessible online. And uh, so a 10-year, $100 million program was carved out. So it's like an astounding thing that anybody could convince an organization like that to put that much money into a project like this. Uh, so going to the natural history collections, digitizing them, et cetera. Uh, the project that I'm part of that's called iDigBio is the hub of this, the center. Our job is to make sure that the digitization efforts are effective, that the workforce of biologists who work with collections and collections data are appropriately trained and to, uh, to, to provide portal access, somewhat like GBIF does, to the data that comes out of collections in the US. Um, and then the other part of this program, this advancing digitization of biodiversity collections, is digitization projects. And uh, they, just, they knew that there was not enough money to digitize everything and so there needed to be some kind of priority. So the way they established priorities was through the natural, way, the normal way that the National Science Foundation does things. People write proposals, uh, they're reviewed by panels, decisions are made and things are funded. So the decision about what to digitize was left up to the community. And that, that established a very strong precedent of the program to be community driven, which has been incredibly important for us. Now, um, I like to brag about our program and say that during a period in which the federal government was trying to find ways to save money, our initial commitment uh, that we got of $10 million over a five-year period turned out to be $13 million. And, and so, so the NSF gave us more money during that first five years than they said they were going to give us. Now, that's astounding, right? Nobody does that. And, and I told the VP for research at the university, and he said, no, no, that's not happening. Everybody's getting cuts this year. No, we got an increase. Okay, so he was, he was pleased. Um, but there's a, there's a reason, and there are reasons for that, and I, I just want to talk a little bit about the way that our emphasis on people and community has led us to being everybody's friend in the, in the, you know, the community. People, so, that, so that when the National Science Foundation asked people what they think of iDigBio, they say, we love them, give them more money. So, you know, it's a, it's a great position to be in. Um, now, the, the whole program has uh, 23 funded projects. Each project has many institutions, some as many as 150 institutions. So this is our map of the organizations that are part of of the overall digitization and mobilization program. So it's very big, we have lots of partners. Uh, they don't all love us, but I think a lot of them do. So what do we do? Our, our driving pr principle is, 
for us. So we're the hub. We're, we're funded. We get a lot of the money. Our job, so we, you know, what we said our job was to enable the success of the overall program. So what we're trying to do is make other people successful. And I'm very fortunate. My, my part of this project, I'm one of the principal investigators. My part of the project has to do with digitization and workforce development. There are other people who are doing research uh, enabling and uh, outreach and education and uh, IT, running the portal. But in, in workforce and digitization, uh, our job is to make the digitization efforts successful. And the way we've done that is by helping people to be, helping people to realize their own potential and do their own work. So we get out of the way, we give other people credit, we, we try and make this all work for everybody. And then we also have portal access. We're, we're working very hard to enable research activities. But I tell you, one of the things that happened was uh, I hired two incredible people who are just, they're, they're people lovers. They, they, I'm a computer scientist. I don't really want to talk to anybody. Um, they just love talking to people. They love making, helping people uh, work with each other. And um, they, one of them, uh, Deb Paul, uh, she was doing a lot of workshops and training, and her, her impression was that the community of biodiversity researchers and collections managers were not capable, had, had missing, were missing some very important tools and their own, their own capabilities to deal with technology and to deal with data, et cetera. So she began doing data enablement workshops, what, what she was calling data carpentry. How do you use Excel? Do you know that sometimes if you import data into Excel, gene names will become dates? It's very strange. It, it's a, it, it, so rules like that, how do you keep that from happening? How do you deal with Excel? You know, and, and then beyond that, what are the other tools? Can you use R? Can you use API? So, so she has set about trying to help people build the skills they need. And the way we do that is not by us telling people what to do, but us recruiting people in the community who will then become the trainers and the developers of the curriculum, et cetera. And we have the funds to, to support workshops and things like that. So the bottom line for me is that our success has been in helping people become more effective in doing their own jobs. It, it's just been a, it's been a great thing. And, and again, as a computer scientist, uh, I, I was astounded that this is how things worked out because you know, you'd think portals and stuff like that would be the, the big issue. All right. Uh, so the, the fact that this is a community-driven process, that we, that we gave the power to decide what we would do to other people and, and, and then give them credit for what they've done, that's kind of been the really successful thing. Now, uh, you may have heard that the Atlantic hurricane season has been fairly active in the last couple of weeks in particular, or last month. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that, and at, at some point I'll, I'll relate it to Ireland, but it'll take me a, a couple of minutes. Um, the original predictions for the hurricane season, and so I live in Florida, so we pay attention to this stuff. I know over here you think, eh, it doesn't matter. But, um, uh, so that each year the, the National Hurricane Center and uh, various people come out and they say, this is how many hurricanes we're going to have, and this is how bad they're going to be, and this is how many are going to strike the United States, and things like that. And they said, no, this year is going to be really mild. It's not going to be a bad year. So some years we have really bad years. The year that Katrina hit New Orleans and wiped out the city, that was a year where there were seven or eight major storms. This was not going to be that. So I want to show you a map of the, the, uh, hurricane, uh, the hurricanes as of uh, the end of September. Well, the, the tropical cyclones. So the map has these legends on it. A list of the storms, each storm has a number, and uh, a date when it started, and a name. So that up at this point, there were 12 named storms. The 13th storm, Michael, was uh, last week. Um, and then down below, you see that the, the tracks are going to be colored according to how intense the storm is at that point in the track. And then somewhere here, there should be another track. Oh, there's a little picture. So, so there's a, a detail of this overall map that you just the coast of Africa is over there on the far right, and um, you can see the storms are labeled. There's dates on there. 
so that if, uh, if you see the one that's labeled uh, six, six is, was a, turned out to be a major hurricane, Florence. Six started September 1. So you can see there's September 1, 2, 3, 4 as it moves across. Okay? And you can also see that the storm goes from green, which is tropical depression, to, to tropical storm, which is winds less than 75 miles an hour, and then into the, the storm, the category, the lower category storms, a one or two, which is winds up to 100 miles an hour, sustained winds. But what happens is the typical, the typical hurricane, the typical big cyclone, somewhere off the coast of Africa, a tropical uh, a depression forms, a low, a low area. And the wind rushes into the low area. And because it's northern hemisphere, it begins rotating uh, anti-clockwise. And as the pressure drops, the, the, the force of the air rushing into the center increases and the winds pick up. And eventually, you get this very stable mass of, of rotating air. OK? That's, that's what happens. And then the, the whole thing moves according to the weather that's around it. So low pressures, high pressures, winds. Uh, sometimes they intensify, and the pressure drops in the center. Uh, and it forms an eye with a wall around it. Uh, sometimes they dissipate. And this map is very nice in, in showing all of that. So here's, I hope. So here's the Atlantic hurricane season through the end of September. Um, OK, so you can see that I, I think that a lot of the storms form off of Africa and move across. This is kind of the traditional way we think of a really big storm. They see it. They, the, the, the people who watch the weather see the development of this low pressure off of Africa, and they watch it come across. And over several days or weeks, that thing builds up and, and either dissipates or becomes bigger. I have, so I have a couple of, of insets. We already saw this one, which is the, the behavior there of several storms that formed uh, off of the African coast, something to do with the hot air in the Sahara or something. I don't know. I'm not a meteorologist, so I'm, I'm just telling you this as a, um, as a, a layman. OK, now uh, this one, this is a, the, the kind of typical behavior we expect in the Gulf of Mexico. So I live on the part of Florida that sticks out uh, on the, over the Gulf of Mexico. So south of me is the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the panhandle of Florida. And, you, and these two storms in the Gulf formed in or, in or around the Gulf of Mexico. And they never really developed very much because they weren't alive very long. right? So they built up a little bit, and they rained some, and there was some wind. But they kind of started in the Gulf, and they built up and dissipated. And we're going to see that Hurricane Michael did not do that, a very different storm. Another storm that I think was really in, the, the biggest uh, damage storm of the year in September was this one, um, Florence. So I, there's three ways that, that these storms damage us. There's rain, there's wind, and there's storm surge. Okay, three things. It pushes water on shore. Katrina, for instance, was a, was a storm surge. The water built up. It went into these huge lakes. The dikes broke. It ran back out again. So that was a storm surge uh, damage. This one, Florence, if you see the dates there, uh, the 13, 14, 15, 16, three days that storm sat on the coast of North Carolina with one end of it in the water like a huge vacuum cleaner sucking water out of the ocean and throwing it on North Carolina. They had some places had a meter of rain. All the rivers flooded. Everybody was underwater in coastal North and South Carolina. A huge disaster. Again, because that storm just sat there. Didn't, didn't go anywhere. OK. And, and these are anomalous storms. This is very late in the season. This is not the way we think storms are going to behave but all the weather currents. Apparently, in, the, in the, uh, North America this year, the Arctic air stayed in the Arctic and didn't begin coming down. And I think the same thing has happened in Northern Europe, right? It's been very hot, been very dry uh, in, uh, around here a lot. For us, we had, every day, we had rain every day for two months this summer. It was a very strange, a chaotic climate environment. Um, I think I have one more here. Oh, yes. Out there in the middle of the Atlantic, all of these storms just wandering around. Okay, now, the one, the one wandering around storm that is of the most interest, which we don't see much here, is the one numbered 12. That's Leslie. Anybody know what Leslie did after wandering around in the ocean for a month? 
I mean, look at the dates. You can't see it too well. No, this week, this Monday, four days ago, Leslie struck Portugal. All right, that is weird. Now, that is a strange event for an Atlantic hurricane to strike the mainland of, of Europe. And, and some, if, if you don't, we, we know how this, we know how big these storms are. We know that the entire eastern United States gets covered by a storm. That they're so, the, the, the outer bands of rain and wind and stuff. But here's a great picture somewhere. So what we see here is wind fields and rain. So off the coast of Portugal, if you can see it, I don't know if you can, there's a circulating, a counterclockwise circulation, which is throwing. Uh, now, this storm, it was a hurricane just off the shore. But in the last little bit, it, it got a little uh, smaller. But they still had 105 mile an hour gusts in Portugal. But to me, the most astounding thing is that band of rain that goes into France. Look how far away from the center that is. Apparently a lot of flooding in southern France as a result of this storm. Again, this was, this was Monday. Right? This picture is from Monday, this week. Um, so, so, and then there was this quote in the story I found about it. Hurricane Michael is also on course to hit. So on top of this, Hurricane Michael, which was, in, which was a Gulf of Mexico storm, ended up coming all the way across the ocean having an impact over here. Um, so the Ireland part of this story is if, if things keep going as chaotically as they are, it's not going to be surprising for you to have storms like this come shooting across the Atlantic. And and this one didn't go across the Atlantic, right? It went out in the middle. It actually formed in the middle of the Atlantic and then moved east. Uh, we think of the kind of following the Gulf Stream. You know, they go around and they go out in the ocean and they die. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we had a very big dose of climate uh, chaos last week. So last week, um, this happened in Florida. And... So it's a church, right? It, we build with sticks, mostly, in, in uh, the U.S., but, so that's kind of a frame building with a, with a brick facade, but you can see that the building has been destroyed. This place is 70 miles inland, okay? And it had 140-mile-an-hour winds in this little town in Florida. And it's very fortunate. A lot, of the, a lot of the damage of these big storms is very dependent on exactly where the storm goes. A mile this way, two miles that way. One of the stories of this storm was that they thought it was going to go on shore and turn to the northeast and come across where I live, and it didn't. Instead, it hit this town. So, um, <laughs> okay. So a little bit about Hurricane Michael, because it, it, I, I, again, I think of it as a chaotic storm. So this is Monday morning, right? Remember now, the Florence was in the Atlantic for two weeks before it hit the coast. This one, you can't see it very well, but the, the colors around the storm are wind speed. There's a little tiny bit of brown, which is the hurricane force winds, on Monday at 1 p.m. And they're making predictions, and the little dots, those are like 12-hour predictions or something. There's predictions forward, what it's going to do. And you can see uh, my town, Tallahassee, is, is there. Uh, above that bump, the 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 red is um, is storm surge warnings. So that's what they were predicting as of Monday morning. Sunday morning, I was in a I was in church and people were saying, you know, there might be a storm coming. I hadn't heard anything about it. Monday, it hit Wednesday, by the way. So this is Wednesday, uh, 48 hours, 50 hours later. It's a huge storm. It moved west, the, the, the track was, was, you know, moved a little bit west of us, which saved us. And, and that part of Florida is mostly pine trees. It's planted pine, they grow paper uh, in North Florida. So it's very low inhabitants, low, low inhabitants, which is a positive thing for, for damage to human stuff. But the red there is the, uh, is the storm surge warning. So they had probably four meter storm surge in those areas of the storm, especially on the right side of the storm where the wind is, 
is, and, and so this, was, this storm was moving 15 miles an hour, and it just kept going. It didn't slow down, so it was not a rain-intensive storm. And the storm surge is a local event in this case because the, the coast is pretty flat. It wasn't building up. Um, this was a wind storm. The damage to this storm was clearly the wind. And um, so here, here's the wind map. Uh, tropical force winds in yellow and the red is this hurricane wind. So the astounding thing about this is the penetration of the hurricane force winds into the U.S. So here we had this storm. Again, we think of these Gulf storms as being kind of weaklings. They're, they don't have enough time to build into real hurricanes. This is a 48-hour event where this storm was nothing. And they said, oh, well, it's going to hit the coast. It's going to be 100 miles an hour. 48 hours later, it was 155 miles an hour uh, when it hit the coast, and it penetrated way in the same. So, so this is climate chaos, and, and uh, these big storms are really serious. Uh, I mean, we, are, we were on the way on the edge of the storm, and, and we had no power. Most of the people in our city had no power for a week. Um, anyway, <laughs> fun with climate. Now, um, when we look at the... Um, the pictures that are published, I read stories about what's happened, and they talk about the change in, the, in the, the environment, what happened to all the trees and the plants and stuff like that. But they don't have many pictures, but I did find one. Um, so as I said, there's a, this is an area which is completely covered by pine trees, or at least on Wednesday morning it was. This is Wednesday afternoon. So an hour later, all of the pine trees are down. That's, a, that's, that's a, a devastating impact on the environment of that part of the country. So that is a, is a nearly permanent change in the environment, uh, right? And that's not to mention what happened to all the animals that were living there and et cetera. So the plants are easier to see. But much of North Florida now looks like that. Much of that area looks like that. So, we, so I, now, so GBIF, right? Okay. You can see I'm, I'm a little obsessed by having spent a week in, in, uh, in the middle of cleaning up my yard and stuff. And, and my house had no trees on it, although there are certainly lots down in my neighborhood. I live in a forest, uh, big oak trees, big pine trees. Um, and, and the last big storm in Tallahassee was 1985. 2016, the university was closed for a week because of a devastating storm. 2017, we were closed for a week in September, even, and, and that was like a false alarm. It didn't actually happen. And then 2018, everybody closed down for a week again. For the 40 years before that, no, you know, since 1985, 30 years of basically no storms, and all of a sudden, three years in a row, we've had major storms. So one of the things we might ask is, what do we know about the environment? What do we know about the the aftermath of storms like this here or other places? What happens when seawater inundates a coastal region? What happens to the habitats? What happens to the environment, et cetera? So we could, we can use the data that's, that's in the natural history collections, in the observation record that, that's stored in GBIF. So this is GBIF looking at that part of Florida. There's a lot of records in there. They, the, they tend to follow the roads. But, um, but that's the way collectors work, right? They go where they can go. And, um, and so some, some additional effort could be made to find out what was there before, what was there after, what was the recovery like from a storm like this in the past by looking at the record. Um, and so th this becomes really important to us, to have this record of biodiversity, which enables us to figure out what we can do about and, and what's likely to happen, what's the impact likely to be. Uh, and so, so enough about uh, storms, right? So what about Ireland? Well, geez, the coastline, right? I mean, you're not Florida. The highest point in Florida is only about 270 feet above sea level. Uh, and it's around that, that little town I showed you. That's about the highest point in Florida. So the coastline of Florida, I live 30 miles inland, and, and the, the lower end of our town is 60 feet above sea level. So the, the coast of Florida is very flat. There's not cliffs and stuff like that. It's just, so the, the storms penetrate fairly easily. 
Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the, the west coast of, of Ireland is almost certainly to, certain to be struck by one of these big storms at some point, because it's, it's, it's not better, right? The, what was to be a weak hurricane season had two of the most destructive hurricanes that have hit the U.S. ever. Florence was hugely destructive, uh, and, and then uh, the new one, Michael. All right, um, but I, I, I do want to talk about the relationship between Ireland and, and GBIF and how the data moves back and forth. And I don't want to take too long because I know we're, we're going into coffee break here. But we do have, and, and I think Liam's going to talk more about what goes on with the data processing in Ireland. Uh, but this is really important. So right now, the Irish people in Ireland, collections and observers, um, uh, citizen science uh, observations, et cetera, are producing a lot of records that go to GBIF. But inside GBIF, you have a huge number of records that are coming from outside of Ireland. So one of the things we get by our interaction with, with GBIF is we get to take our data that we have about our country and we get to add data that other people have about our country. Right, so the natural history collections, of course, in London and Paris and New York and et cetera, they have lots of collections from all around the world. So the integration of that data becomes really important. Um, another thing is that GBIF produces a lot of, they do a lot of analysis of data and, and based on, so we have this national uh, approach to GBIF. So the nation is a member, Ireland is a member of GBIF and there's a national node, and the national node interacts with GBIF, and GBIF does things for the national node, so producing these reports uh, that Donald was talking about. Uh, so it also, of course, allows people in Ireland who are working on Irish stuff or non-Irish stuff to be able to get the data they need to, to do the research and produce papers and do policy, et cetera. Uh, and, um, I think I just want to stop, uh, end with, a, with a, uh, a little bit about one study, um, that, that this is a Badger study that takes information from Ireland and about Ireland, puts it together, and, and can then make assertions. As uh, uh, Donald was talking about the American mink, the invasiveness of the American mink, it's another example. Also, uh, GBIF has an awards program, and we have a Young Researcher Award, and, oh, geez. Quiva. Quiva. I asked before. <laughs> I asked before, and, and I was told, but, you know, it's just all to Quiva. So she won, uh, and, uh, and uh, I, so tw in 2014, so four years ago, she was the winner, and uh, Connor Ryan uh, in 2011. Okay. All right, so I'm going to stop. So, uh, so uh, the interaction, we're, we're very interested in encouraging the interaction between Ireland and the, the people who produce and consume data in Ireland and all of these international organizations that are, that are working so hard to get that data and make it manageable and, and downloadable and discoverable. So, and thank you very much for having me. I've, I've really enjoyed my time in Ireland.